Hello there and welcome back to the section on mental models. So one of our pursuits is to understand what the underlying system will do as part of um, uh, as a reaction rather or in an attempt to execute a line of code what is it that the system will do and uh, you know in order to be able to reason about that we'll first need to take a look at the system. All right so the system is very straightforward and my claim is that uh, this model of the system can essentially enable us to reason about you know pretty much all of the C programs you know any C programs you can reason based on this model and the model is simply this there is a CPU and you know there is and we're going to assume simplicity also so you know one thing you should remember is all models represent reality and are not completely accurate they're just models they're just representing the reality so this is one such model and my claim is that a model like this uh, will suffice the reasoning around um, the c programs or reasoning about the c programs right and the model goes something like this uh, what we have here is a cpu and a cpu essentially executes instructions right that's what uh, we should imagine a cpu executes instructions that's the only thing and it's connected to the memory uh, via let's say some buses and the, the slash here essentially is representing that well first off what is a bus so a bus is bunch of wires and the slash here is representing that there are a bunch of wires uh, on which the the information goes from the cpu to the memory right and the slash essentially just means it's not one wire it's many wires and you can see that you know the, from here the direction is towards the memory and in the next one the direction is kind of between the memory and the cpu so uh, information so to speak can flow in either direction uh, electrical signals essentially bits uh, those are being shared and can move from memory to cpu cpu to memory fair all right, that's number one. And the second one is that we have another bus, uh, another pair of bus here rather, right? Uh, and the only difference there is uh, we have one bus going to the memory and we have another bus going from memory to the CPU, fair? So, so far, hopefully so far so good. So the memory is where two things live. And again, we'll separately talk about the memory, separately talk about the CPU. And right now what we're focusing on is the system. Right? And the system, again, the system is the one that we are going to use to reason about our C programs. That's why we are pursuing all of this. Okay, so the fundamental difference then is uh, there are two pairs of bus. This is pair number one, you know, this. And then there is another pair here. So the first pair, you see that there are two buses. One bus goes from memory to CPU, the other bus goes from CPU to memory, right? And the only difference that the other bus has here, the other bus pair has here, is that one of them is bidirectional, fair? Now let's put some names onto these. So let me just uh, switch to a different nice color. Hopefully it will be visible. So the, the bus, pair number one here we'll call that the instruction buses and if this doesn't make sense again just hang on and stay with me because everything will so both these buses we club together and we call them or we name them instruction buses and the other one we call them data buses right okay perfect so what is individual individual bus in the bus pair now so we call the one going from cpu to memory the address bus right okay let me just write it correctly the address bus and the other one going from memory to um, um to the cpu we call it the instruction bus right and this is our nomenclature you can you know go onto the internet and maybe you'll find slightly different nomenclature but in our course uh, for our discussion this is the nomenclature we'll use and we can you know uh, call this the second the one going from cpu to 
um, the CPU to memory, we can call it actually instruction address bus. Fair. So what you can imagine imagine happening now is that our code is present in the memory. You know the instructions are present in the memory. How how they go there? You know what format they are in. We'll discuss that in due time. But assume that the memory holds the code, it has the instructions that the CPU can read and the CPU essentially then sends address or a location. So address, uh, instruction address bus is essentially carrying a number and that number essentially means, okay, at that location number, let's say number four, at that location, whatever is the bit pattern, uh, you know just fetch it or bring it to the cpu and how does it come to the cpu it comes via the instruction bus right so hopefully one thing is very clear so far which is the cpu sends an address over the instruction address bus to the memory as a response to that request the memory responds back uh, with some data and that data is interpreted interpreted as an instruction okay so at least as of now, I just want you to hold that visualization or that piece of information with you. So instructions, for example, can be add, subtract, multiply, those kind of things. So when we are adding, let's say, we also need data to add together, right? We need number one, number two to be added together and the answer needs to be, you know, put somewhere. Okay. so based on the instruction the cpu understands if there is some data that it needs to read from the memory fair just just trust me with that the instruction also tells the cpu and that's the whole point of an instruction it tells the cpu as to what data manipulation it should do and if the data manipulation to be done uh, is kind of in the memory uh, then that data first needs to be kind of you know fetched to the CPU to do the addition, for example, right? So what the CPU then does is it kind of sends the address for the data on another bus. And so this, what we call the second bus pair as data bus. So it is going to send the address out to the memory on the uh, data address, address bus, right? And again, if you know, you're Kind of trying to understand why are we looking at all of these diagrams you know this long explanation it's so fundamental uh, to understanding the c language correctly and being able to confidently write programs that we understand how the underlying system is or what we can visualize and that's why we are after this right and now hopefully you also understand why the direction here is from cpu to memory because we are supposed to send the information about the location where the data is from cpu to the memory and as a result of uh, you know that request the memory is going to send back the data right it could be a number that needs to be added incremented decremented whatever right so the data will come on the data bus right so we simply call it the data bus because that's where the data is coming now inter interestingly this is bidirectional right which means if we want to write back into the memory let's say we computed an answer the cpu has added two numbers and computed an answer like one plus two is three so that three now needs to be written back somewhere right if we want to store it then essentially you know the 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 cpu needs to again issue an address let's say something like hex 20 saying hey you know write this value whatever i'm sending on the data bus to the location 20 right so the data bus is involved in doing like the read write of data the instruction bus is involved in kind of fetching the instructions and so um, this is essentially how the system is for us at least the cpu memory interaction is and so the other thing that i want to introduce here which i should have done earlier except i just missed that completely so let me get the yellow color back there would be one line, one extra line going from the CPU to the memory. And that line is the one which dictates whether it's a read or a write. So a single line can have a binary state, zero or one. You know, voltage can be high, voltage can be low. So if it is 
low, it means it's a write. If it's a one, then it means it's a read. So what this extra line is going to be used for on the data bus pair is to convey whether the CPU is wanting to read or write. Fair. So hopefully if you're convinced with the story so far, I'm going to slightly alter this model. And um, a formal name for this model is the load store. Uh, I'm just completely messing up the spelling. Right. So it's called the load store architecture, right? Which means uh, before the CPU does any manipulation of the data, it is going to fetch it from the memory, do it internally, do the computation internally, and we'll explore what internally means. But it is going to do the computation and send back the answer to the memory, right? So again, just a quick revision. We have the memory. And by the way, as you're going through this course, um, uh, you should not stress about remembering anything because I'll repeat it so many times that you'll remember even if you don't want to, right? Okay, so we call this the bus pair. This was the data bus pair. And then I told that there would be a single wire for the read and write. And then there would be a separate bus pair uh, for the instruction, right? So this is for instruction. This all is for data, right? Perfect. So what I just explained to you, uh, and obviously this is a model. So back in 1970s, this is how the systems were, right? There was a memory, there was a CPU, and then there were computations to be done, right? And the computations are done essentially on the data that is present in the memory, right? How the memory is implemented, how the CPU is implemented, we don't really care about it. All we know is that there was a memory, there was a CPU, there were wires between those, and the CPU could float an address and get back an instruction or data, right? And in our discussion, this is the model we'll follow. This is uh, kind of the model we'll follow. There was another thing back in 1970s that people would do, which is light up bulbs and you know take inputs from switches so that idea is the idea of io how do you take input how do you you know give out the output so we are going to start uh, or just take a look at that so those are called peripherals and uh, peripherals we can just assume them to be here right and this could be like light bulbs and switches and how do i represent switches let's say like this because they had like the on and off switches so what i'm going to propose now is a modern concept but it's so useful that it'll just enable all of the low level programming in today's world for us right you'll be able to understand and manipulate any hardware using this mode of thinking and the formal name of that is called the memory mapped IO. So you can look this term up on the internet and you'll get to learn a lot more. So what is memory mapped IO? What it means is there is hardware. So there is, let's say, you know, an LED that lights up. LED is essentially LED lights. Uh, look up what LED is. So let's say you want to light, uh, light up an led so the the idea is that lighting up let's say an entire row of led would simply translate to modifying some memory location the hardware is designed in such a way that there would be certain addresses certain locations that if you write to the system infers that, hey, actually you wanted to turn on a light. And similarly, if I have the switch being toggled, a memory location will capture the state of the switch. Okay, so this is a rudimentary idea right now. The, the idea is around peripherals. Right, and the concept that I highlighted is called the memory mapped IO. Okay, so then the summary of what we have or what we'll visualize the system to be is a CPU, a 
a memory right and the memory has code the memory has data and finally it has a way to control io and how do we control just by reading and writing to some addresses and again if you're not understanding that no worries it will eventually sink in you know i'll give you so many examples that you will just remember it and right so this is what we said the model was and then as a result of writing here the peripherals will get modified you know light bulbs will go off go on or go off and uh, whatever the state of switch is that can be conveyed in okay so just let this model sink in you know accept this model this is called again load store architecture and what load store essentially means is the data needs to be brought in computation needs to be done and the answer sorry answer needs to be sent back right so that's the load compute store model right all right so if you are convinced with this model what we are now going to do is talk about how the cpu is to be imagined how a, a programmer can imagine a cpu to be and how a programmer can imagine a memory to be right and once you have those two models together uh, we are good to go with reasoning about what is machine code what is assembly code what is instruction set architecture so on and so forth so with this i'll see you in the next one bye bye